بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم صلاة وسلام عليك يا رسول الله لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله أستغفر الله جزاك الله to everyone for coming up again uh, turning up and uh, I've heard some brothers listen to our recordings as well so uh, you know جزاك الله to the brothers who uh, listen to the recording as well uh, I didn't realize myself that much um, that the recordings go out and some brothers listen whilst they're driving or something to the audio uh, as long as you still pay attention whilst you're driving and don't cause an accident and blame me it was his dars so when I the charges against me. Uh, chapter number 44, so we've only got 44 uh, to uh, the last four chapters. Uh, inshallah, may Allah Pah give us the to finish. Uh, and so the 44th of the 47 diseases or the sins of the heart are extravagance. So the Urdu word, Arabic word is Israf. We hear that a lot in Urdu as well, Israf. And usually we translate it wasting. So we could have translated this uh, wasting money. Um, Again, a definition, a verse of the Quran, a hadith, a bark, a possible story, and then the causes and cures. Definition of extravagance. Uh, extravagance means to spend money where it is Islamically, uh, socially, or morally prohibited to spend. Uh, so Islamically, socially, morally prohibited to spend. For example, spending in places of sins and disobedience, or spending on strangers in a way that leaves your own family uh, destitute and uh, poor. TK uh, Israf, just wasting money. Uh, Allah Bag says in the glorious Quran, Kareem, "Wala tusrifu innahu la yuhibbu al-musrifin," and do not spend wastefully. Indeed, he does not like the wasteful people. So there's that word Israf. Allah Taala says, "La tusrifu," don't do Israf, don't waste. In Allah la yuhibbul musrifin, musrifin wasters. Uh, so in Arabic, you know the, the Arabic language, the word israf means to waste. So tusrifu is you don't waste, la tusrifu. And musrif is a waster. So twice in that ayat of Nima Allah Park mentioned the word wasting, la tusrifu, don't waste, because Allah does not love musrifin, the wasters. If you go straight to the uh, commentary, the honorable translator, Allah Hazrat Imam of the Ahli Sunnah, has used a useless spending for the translation of Israf, which is an excellent translation. If you spend all your money and give nothing to your family, consequently end up poor yourself, then according to uh, Sudbi, uh, one of the Imams, this is extravagant spending. So spending too much on other people and your own family, leaving them in a problematic situation, that's Israf as well. Uh, not donating your money to charitable, charitable causes is also inappropriate and constitutes israf as stated by uh, Sayyid Ibn Musayyib. So not spending your money on um, charitable causes, this is also uh, wasting. It's uh, conducive as well as, as wasting. Before we turn over, uh, so israf is not just like wasting loads of money. You know, when you think of wasting, we think about extravagant spending okay, we'll, we'll talk about that in a bit but even if you spend one pound on something that's haram that's israf you wasted money so israf is not just uh, lavish lashing out your cash wasting on extravagances and you, like the definition was uh, to spend money where it is islamically socially or morally prohibited so even spending one pound on something that's haram that's a waste of money that's extravagance that's israf as well Okay. If we turn over Sufyan Rahimahullah Ta'ala explains spending your sorry, here is spending even a small amount of money in anything other other than the obedience of Allah Almighty is extravagance itself. Uh, Zuhri, Imam Zuhri Rahmatullah, he stated that the ayat means do not spend in sin. Imam Mujahid he said a wastage yani israf means falling short in fulfilling your duties to Allah Almighty. If the Abu Qubais mountain was made of gold and you spent it all in the path of Allah Ta'ala, then this would not be extravagance. It would not be wasting. Yet if you spend even one dirham or one pound in sin, then this would constitute extravagance. Okay. Uh, you know, when we spend on Milad, we spend a lot and you know, people object to even our five pound balloons. 
yeah, this is a waste of money. You could have gone to the fakirs and these khatams and you put flags up. Uh, uh, this is a waste of money. So uh, all of that uh, expenses, all of those expenses on Bilal, that's not a wastage uh, because it's with, with the intention of respecting the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Just like the Hilafi Kaaba uh, costs millions, but I mean, no one says that's wasting. That's respecting the Kaaba. The, there's a, a, an unbelievable amount spent on uh, the uh, preservation and the uh, maintenance of Makkah Sharif, uh, Masjid Haram, uh, Masjid Haram, and Masjid Al Nabi Sharif, uh, but no one says that's israf extravagance. But the same people who spend all those millions, even on the Hilafit Kaaba, I think I once read, but I think it's only two, three, four million dollars spent on this thing because it's a, a, a proper gold, the calligraphy, uh, which is not wajib, it's not certain, but it's good because that's ta'zim on the house of Allah, that's ta'zim of. Uh, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So similarly on the same lines is the Milad Sharif. Uh, but the same people who spend millions in Mecca and Medina on the Masjid Sharif and on the Kaaba and on the gold writing have a problem with our four or five pound balloons and our uh, flags, our small flags on the uh, Milad. Uh, so this is, you know, Allah, Allah guides whoever he wants and he misguides whoever he wants. Um, in another place, Allah Almighty commands, "Kulu wa shrabu wa la tusrifu inna hu la yuhibbu musrifin." Eat and drink, and do not cross the limit. Do not do israf. There's that word again, "wa la tusrifu israf na karu." La tusrifu. It's the present male masculine version of "don't do israf." So eat, drink, just don't cross the limit. Don't waste. Indeed, he does not like those who cross the limit. Inna hu la yuhibbu musrifin. Okay. So again. Uh, he does not like uh, this is a different verse to the first one that we did again to sleep food so eat and drink uh, Allah you know eat and drink uh, Allah doesn't prohibit that enjoy halal things but as long as you're not wasting and you're not getting arrogant and proud with the eating and drinking again the tafsir the reason for the revelation uh, Kelbi Imam Kelbi stated in order to show respect for the Hajj during the Hajj season the Bani, Isra, the Bani Amir tribe consumed less food and totally abstain from eating meat and fat. Uh, the Muslims witnessed this and remarked, O Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we ought to do this more than them. So they're out of respect for the Hajj. So even the non-Muslims in Mecca Sharif, the Kaaba wasn't just a, a place and a symbol of reverence for only the Muslims, even the non-Muslims and the Mushriks, the idol worshippers, pre-Islam. There were idols inside the Kaaba pre-Islam. So even they revered it and they had different ways of showing respect as well. And one of the ways is that in their, their pilgrimage season, they would eat less and totally abstain from eating meat and fat. So some of the Muslims said, Ya Rasulullah, well, if we read on the Haq, we should then avoid eating meat and fat and uh, eat less more than the Kafirs read on the Haq. Uh, but following which Allah might reveal this verse, instructing people to eat and drink whether meat or fat without being extravagant. And extravagance includes continuous eating despite having a full stomach or not bothering about forbidden things. It is also extravagance, Israf, to make something forbidden upon yourself, which is not prohibited by Allah Almighty. So that's a, a sort of third definition of extravagance, Israf. Making something haram that isn't haram. And in that, again, uh, automatically Milad comes to, Gyarim Sharif comes to mind. Things that are not haram and calling them haram. You know, just something's not haram, you know, usko haram kevina. And vice versa is then something which is haram saying it's not haram. So you know, changing the akamat of Allah, uh, that is uh, israf as well. Sayyidina Ibn Abbas radiallahu he said, eat what you want and wear what you want, but avoid extravagance and arrogance. The ruling. This verse is proof that all foods and drinks are lawful halal except those that are prohibited by Islamic law, since it is a well accepted orthodox principle that all things are essentially lawful except those that have been prohibited by Islamic law. And this prohibition must be established by independent evidence. In like in courts, what's the rule? Uh, innocent until proven guilty. So to summarize those five lines, halal uh, until proven uh, haram. Okay. So uh, everything is essentially halal. Uh, if someone says something is halal, he doesn't really need evidence for that. If the one who says claims that is haram is the one that needs to provide the evidence. Okay. 
Uh, coming to the bottom, a prominent Quranic commentator, Hakim al umma Mufti Ahmad al Khan Naimi Rahmatullah, explains in his Tafsir Naimi, there are many definitions of extravagance of the word Israf. There are many uh, definitions of Israf. And he's given 11 here, 11 possible different meanings. Um, number one, believing lawful things to be unlawful, uh, such as the Milad and Gyarim Sharif. Number two, use, utilizing unlawful things. Number three, eating, drinking, or wearing more than necessary. Number four, eating, drinking, or wearing whatever you desire in every single thing, like being spoiled. Number five, constantly eating and drinking throughout the day and night to an extent that leads to stomach problems as well as other medical issues. So this is like going over the top, Israf, extravagance. Number six, eating and drinking harmful and dangerous things. This is Israf, extravagance. Number seven, also contemplate, always contemplating about what to eat, drink, or wear, such as what should I eat now, what shall I drink later. So being obsessed, being obsessed with food, that's an extravagance as well. It's not haram, but you shouldn't be obsessed with it. Number eight, eating for negligence. Number nine, eating to sin. Eating now so that you've got more strength and you've got the intention to do a, commit a sin later, so you want more strength to do that sin. Number ten, becoming habitual of eating, drinking delicious foods and wearing fancy clothes to the extent that you cannot eat or drink average quality foods or drinks. Being spoiled really, where right? you can't even suffice with basic things now because you're just uh, used to extravagance. And number 11, to believe the acquisition of delicious foods to be a result of your personal uh, excellence. Okay. These are different various uh, meanings stated by the Sufiya or the scholars or the uh, scholars or experts of the Quran and Hadith regarding what israf means, what extravagance means, what you know, going over the top. Allah Ta'ala says He doesn't like Musrifeen, He doesn't like people who do israf, who go over the top. So that is, you know, uh, those are 11, all of them are worth just focusing on, especially in this day and age, we've got this food culture and we're just obsessed with food and okay, it's good. I mean, we're not saying it's haram to have milkshakes and stuff and treat yourself every now and then, but uh, we need to do tawajjo with our children as well. Being obsessed to the extent where our kids, um, even if you put like a, a massive pizza in front of them and just because it's... Uh, he has or hasn't got pineapple on them. They don't want to eat anything. And they're sending you at uh, 12 o'clock or 1 o'clock a.m. Uh, at night uh, to get a different style pizza. That, you know, you all understand what I'm saying. The spoiling and going over the top. You cannot only want to tell you. Okay. We could at any time find ourselves in a situation where we just uh, uh, sufficing on the basics. So uh, if you're not extravagant and you're used to treating yourself to the basics, then if you do find yourself in a difficult situation, you'll be quite patient. Otherwise, you'll just be paranoid. You'll go paranoid. Okay. Uh, we go paranoid these days if our Wi-Fi goes off uh, for 10 minutes. Wi-Fi connection, or if you're downloading something and it's taking 10 seconds more than... Uh, in short, this one word, this word Israf, includes many rules, many things. In an important clarification about the extravagance, about Israf and going over the top. The Islamic brother, it is very important to clarify here that just as the statement... La khayra fil israf. There is nothing commendable in extravagance. I, there's no goodness in israf. Just as that is true, it's also true. La israf fil khayr. There's no extravagance in virtuous deeds and good deeds. All praises for Allah Almighty. Alhamdulillah. Every year in the blessed month of Rabiul Awwal, hundreds of thousands of Muslims celebrate the birth of their master and most, uh, most beloved holy prophet, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, by decorating their homes, their shops, their neighborhoods, and their streets by hosting and waving beautiful green flags, illuminating localities with multicolored lights and candles, donating to charities, distributing food, arranging gatherings of zikr and nasheeds, and inviting scholars for the benefit of listening to their speeches about the sublime birth of the Holy Prophet ﷺ. In a similar manner, magnificent celebrations to convey reward are enjoyed on the occasions of the death anniversaries, the urs of the Honorable Sahaba ﷺ, family members of the Holy Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa and various pious people, awliya ikiram rahimahumullah. Without doubt, these are all commendable practices and remember there is no wastage in praiseworthy deeds. The more you spend on them, the better. Uh, Allah Hazrat, uh, skip three lines, Allah Hazrat Azim al-Barakat Mujadid Deen Millat Parwana Isha Mirisal Maulana Shah Imam Ahmad Raza Khan rahmatullahi was asked, is it a waste of money to spend on fancy lights, candles, etc. on the occasion of Milad or not? The eminent Shaykh replied that prominent scholars have said La khayra fil israf wa la israf fil khayr. There's no good in wastage and there's no wastage in good. Okay. There's no good in israf and there's no israf in good. 
anything done with the intention of respecting the remembrance of the Holy Prophet ﷺ can never be prohibited. Turn over page 296. Imam Ghazali reported in Ihya ul Ulum on the authority of Sayyiduna uh, Abu Ali Ruz Bari that once a God fearing man arranged a gathering of zikr wherein he lit a thousand candles. Okay. So out would be oh, Israf, why is he little? Oh, what's the point of a thousand candles? A narrow minded man with only external perception reached a gathering but turned back, showing his disapproval of the abundance of candles considering this to be wastage. The organizer took hold of his hand, the Shaykh, before leading him inside and instructing. So he took him inside and he said, if there is any candle that I lit for someone other than Allah Almighty, then extinguish it. The man tried but failed to extinguish a single candle. Okay, so that was an Israf. Uh, this story was by Imam Ghazali. Here's a blessed hadith. Sayyiduna Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As anhu narrated that once the Holy Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he noticed Sayyiduna Sa'ad radiallahu anhu doing wudu and he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam remarked O oh, Sa'ad what is this wastage so don't even waste water in wudu even the wudu is a good thing but it doesn't mean spend half an hour to which he responded Hazrat Sa'ad responded O oh, Messenger of Allah Ya Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Is it possible to waste water during wuzu as well? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam replied Yes, even if you are at a flowing stream And he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam answered uh, On another occasion he declared Eating absolutely everything you desire is extravagance So that's a hadith as well This is going over the top as well Just eating everything that you that Every khayish, every craving of yours That's going over the top Hold back. That's what Ramzan is about as well, isn't it? Ramzan should be holding back. Simplicity. A ruling on extravagance. If extravagance and excessive spending are against Shariat, then they are forbidden. So Israf can be haram as well. But if they are against common norms, then they are minorly disliked. So Israf can be haram. Israf can be makru tanzihi. Remember, makru tanzihi is jaiz, halal, but it's disliked. So Israf is not always haram. It can either be haram or makruta and zihi, depending on what you're actually doing. Uh, spending even one pound on sin is haram. Uh, but this spending on expensive foods, that's not haram, but at the same time, you know, it's risky. Uh, don't want to spoil your nafs. Okay. Uh, so I'll quickly read this example. Uh, this is a story. A Sheikh Tariqat Amin Ahl Sunnat, Dam Barakatul Maliyah. He was requested to lay the foundation for Fazani Medina and Sahara Medina in Karachi. He was requested to lay the foundation of a massive madrasa. And he said, on such occasions of laying foundations of significant structures, people usually invite a popular dignitary like a Sheikh or a Peer to pour cement in the excavated foundation, sometimes to lay the first brick. And that's why he was being called to, we're opening a madrasa, will you pass, you know, lay the foundation. But the sheikh, our sheikh replied, but this is just a tradition. There's usually no use for that cement, etc. later. In my opinion, it's a wastage of cement, even though it's a bit. If the wasted cement, etc. is bought with donations collected from masjid, and as well as repenting, you must also compensate for the wasted donations. And remember who's saying this? This is the person being invited as a VIP guest. The Hazrat Abu Tashrif line. And usually anyone being invited, will you come and please cut the ribbon or lay the first brick or that first bit of cement? We jump to the occasion. This is what more would my nafs want? Usually people will jump at that kind of thing. It's a VIP, celebrity pictures, everything. For as long as even after you've died, people are going to say, Bunyad fulani rakiti. Fame, all you, did, all you did was put a brick. You're famous for the next 60, uh, 160 years. But he's writing a letter back to the inviters. I think it's, to be honest with you, it's a, it's a waste. That cement is used. If it was being used, but usually it's, it's of no use. That It's just a tradition and there's no... So in my opinion, it's wasted. Uh, and he's telling the people, who, uh, who brothers who've invited him, who most likely his own murids, his own murids have invited him. Uh, but he's saying... Uh, that if you've uh, brought that cement for the donation of the public and then that you've wasted that, well, that's haram, isn't it? Uh, wasting public donations is haram, even if wasting one pound that someone's given you for a madrasa 
you go into some cement which is not used properly and thrown away. Hence, someone suggested, uh, Huzur, uh, someone else suggested, what if instead we have an inscribed plaque for you to uncover, unveil a plaque of our new madrasa? To which the Sheikh replied, there's a difference between uncovering a stone and laying a foundation for a building. Uh, at the present moment, the ground is totally plain and so there is a strong chance that even the plaque will go to waste. If there's no building, what do you want me to, where are you going to put the plaque? Um, eventually, Amelia Ahl Sunnah proposed, whatever you practically intend to build a pillar, you first decide there's actually going to be a pillar on this flat land, there's going to be a pillar. Fulfill the tradition of excavating a hole in that spot, as you're supposed to do any with some shovels. Instead of labeling it, laying the first brick, refer it to as the commencement of construction. Uh, consequently, on 22nd Rabiul level 1426, uh, so this was 20 years ago. Uh, by the way, 1446 has started now for us, hasn't it? Today is the second day of 1446. So 20 years ago, this story, corresponding with Sunday, 1st May 2005, in compliance with his wish, Due to his ardent admiration for Sayyids, 25 small Sayyid boys personally excavated a specific area of land with digging tools. So that was for Barakat, the our madrasa, we starting a new madrasa. Let's have the Barakat of the Sayyids. Let's get 25 madrasa students or small Sayyid boys. They'll dig uh, the, uh, uh, that pillar. He also took part himself, the Sheikh, and consequently the construction of Fazani Medina uh, in Karachi commenced in glorious uh, fashion. Uh, so that doesn't mean, you know, um, that, that was the Sheikh's search that even a bit of cement should go to waste. If you can use that cement uh, without it going to waste, if you can put a plaque without the plaque getting thrown away, that's fine. But that was our Sheikh's sort of uh, meticulous and careful nature and his vigilance uh, rather than jump to the occasion and say, fine, you okay, when do you want me to come and uh, okay, I'll, I'll uh, initiate. What, what's the word? Inaug what's inaugurate mean? You know, great, yeah. Causes and cures for extravagance. Uh, the first cause of extravagance is what is unawareness and ignorance. When a person spends his money on something without Islamic knowledge, then the possibilities of wasting it are very high, which he fails to detect due to his lack of awareness. So obviously you have knowledge of Shariat, so you know something's haram and halal. You might know, uh, I shouldn't spend on haram things, but hold on, do you know, what, do you know the list of haram things? Okay. Uh, so, uh, knowledge. Uh, the second cause of extravagance is arrogance and pride. Sometimes a person spends his money unnecessarily merely due to exert superiority over other people. Okay? And I'll, I'm going to read something to you from Bahari Shait, Abu Walimas these days. I'll read something to you. Uh, you can contemplate this, obviously, uh, remove pride and arrogance from your heart, which is one of the diseases that we've studied. Uh, the third cause of extravagance is a desire for compliments. Unnecessary spending of money in order to be praised by other people is a common social evil. Okay. Uh, again, we know the cure, cure, cure your desire for compliments. What's the fourth cause of extravagance? A desire for fame. Again, similar. The real reason for spending money on shameless functions and other sinful parties is a desire for fame and popularity. Uh, okay. And number five, the fifth cause of extravagance is negligence and carelessness. We sometimes know that spending in a certain cause is a waste of money, but due to negligence and carelessness, we still waste it. Uh, leaving a tap running during wuzu, leaving electrical appliances operating even in your house, in your office, etc. Due to laziness are also consequences of uh, extravagance or causes of extravagance. Okay, so the cure for this is for us to start being more sensitive, even your ibijili at home. Uh, Contemplate about being judged for the sins that you commit in this world due to negligence and carelessness. Uh, uh, repent from food waste. Just a final message for today's class, today's lesson. Uh, this night, brothers, these days every person complains about a shortage of blessings in his livelihood as well as other financial problems. It would be no surprise if livelihoods uh, lacking blessings or actually punishments for disrespecting bread. There probably is not a single Muslim today who does not waste bread, roti. Everywhere we look, we see heartbreaking spectacles of disrespect for food, whether in wedding ceremonies or death anniversaries of, of Muslim, even in ursis and khatams in masjids. This is an extremely, extremely sad truth. Food is sensitively dropped, uh, insensitively dropped onto mats, carpets, and during meals. People are allow, allow chunks of meat to remain attached to bones. And a few bites and there's 
still meat left. Many morsels of food are wasted along with the spices. Most people do not consider reusing the small quantities of food left in trays or the remaining curry in large or small plates in our Asian communities. Large, large quantities of such leftover food are disposed of in bins. Please repent for all of the food that you have wasted so far. Please make a firm resolution to avoid wasting a single grain of food or drop of curry salan in the future. I swear by Allah Almighty, you will have to account for every single grain on the day of judgment. Without a shadow of a doubt, not a single person can endure the accountability of judgment day. Please repent with sincere repentance, recite the Rusif and then implore, ask Allah Ta'ala, Oh Allah Almighty, I repent for everything that I have wasted till now and for all other, other minor and major sins. I shall try my absolute best to avoid sins in the future with your divine assistance. O Lord Mustafa Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, please accept my repentance and forgive me without judging me. Amin Bijahin Nabi Al Amin Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we did, uh, I think, uh, I don't know if it was Tahir or someone else who asked in the class, it might have been Ajwad, uh, but whoever it was, uh, there was a question asked that if someone's like a millionaire or billionaire and he's spending, uh, you know, uh, like uh, 20,000 on a wedding, but that's nothing for him, is that Israf as well? Um, and so I did pose that question to the uh, to Darul Ifta, uh, and they said, you know, if you keep in mind the definition of Israf, where uh, spending and as long as there's no if there's no arrogance if there's any arrogance in there or showing off in there which are both haram or the spending on sins such as the dancing and music okay um or any haram uh, traditions then that is israf but if there's a wedding and someone's not boring and he's not showing off he's not spending that much he's a millionaire he's not uh, there's no he's not spending on haram traditions and music and dancing he's not showing off and he's not arrogant uh, then you know we can't say that person is doing haram okay so we've obviously got to give a muslim the benefit of the doubt uh, it's not our job to just say someone's but if there's clearly something haram happening uh, uh yeah so if someone spends the conclusion of that is uh, from what i gathered from the fatwa that i got from doubt uh, from the mufti self that if someone he is really loaded and for him spending a lot on the wedding venue and stuff that's not a problem it won't come under israf but it's very hard to avoid showing off and attention and fame and usually we want to be able to say that we want to do our shadi of our daughter or son in a way that the whole town is saying it was a unique wedding so when that fame and that desire to be unique and the desire for the whole of black to be talking about our event that that's where the intention um i said i was going to read something from uh, Bahari Sharia to you and then we'll finish. Uh, yeah. Uh, a Walima, Walima here is. Uh, Walima is a sunnah, right? Uh, we could. Uh, when the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam married Hazrat Safiya radiallahu ta'ala anha. Uh, anha uh, the Vadima, there was no ghost in the Vadima, there was no roti. And there were just khujurs and some cheese and uh, ghee. Uh, yeah, there was no khubs, there was no roti, and there was no ghost in one of the Vadimas of our Prophet. Uh, so, Vadima is sunnat and you definitely accept. But Baharishi says, uh, <coughs> Valima is a, a sunnah to accept a Valima Dawat when the people who are having the holding the Valima Dawat are doing it with the intention of sunnah. If their intention, the organizer's the intention is tafakhur, pride, ya meri wahwa hogi, fame. Jesse is a zamani me aksar yehi dekha jata hai. Now he wrote this book a hundred years ago and he's saying hamare zamani me aksar most of the time it's pride, it's tafakhur. So pir aisi Dawato me na shariq hona better hai. Okay, it's better to not uh, uh, attend such a uh, wedding. So it's, it's really it's a very delicate and a subtle. Uh, Valima, वैसे we've Valima वैसे uh, it's not a topic today. But Dawati Valima सिर्फ पहले दिन है या उसके बाद दूसरे दिन ये इसके बाद Valima और शादी खत्म. Hindustan में uh, this is before the partition of India and Pakistan. Hindustan में शादियों का सिलसिला कई दिन तक कायम रहता है. Sunnat se aage barna riya, riyakari showing off hai, isse bachana zaruri hai. 
So Valima is just, uh, yeah. I'm just reading, uh, I've got in front of me, I think Hazrat Ali and Fatima in their Valima as well. I don't think there was any gosh, uh, some halwa. Yeah, I'll have to confirm that, but it says here, Abu Halwa Tanawa Um Yeah, I think Huzur alayhi salatu wasalam in the Valima of Sayyidah Fatima, he himself, he took some dates and there was some ghee, some like butter uh, and some cheese and he mixed them all up and he made a sort of halwa himself. And there might have not even been any ghost in Sayyidah Fatima's Valima. Uh, I'm not trying to say that the Fatah, you're not allowed to have ghost in uh, Valima's, just proving the simplicity of the uh, the Sunnah of the Prophet. There's a hadith that says the Prophet said, Do Valima, even if it's with one uh, one bakri, with one sheep or goat. And then the, I was reading Bahari Shariat for you that uh, if someone's doing a Valima, uh, the man, the, the, the groom, uh, it's only the first day after uh, the wedding night or the second day, not after the second day. Uh, if they got married and then the Rukhsati didn't happen, the Rukhsati happened a year later and the Valima is like uh, when the Rukhsati did happen the next day. Okay. And uh, that's when you get Sawab. If someone is doing a Valima and the intention is Fakhr and Guru, then you don't get a Sawab of fulfilling a Sunnat. Yeah, it's actually Haram because of the showing off. When you mentioned um, someone wants to do Bulima, uh, someone wants to do it, but if you uh, do it better, but it has a, a certain type of food, people will talk, or people will uh, give you negative comments. Yeah. Would you measure your arrogance with that? Um, well, you know, Bulima, you know, just calling a few friends at the restaurant is Bulima, Sunnah Tadaw Zakri. Getting a few friends uh, in a restaurant. Take away and bad care, those who are living in Sunnat Kinyat Kalam, inshallah. Simplicity. It's a few. I want to do more with the supermarket. Like you mentioned, the shopping bag. Yeah. You added in the shopping bag. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, Ghazali says that. Is that a good thing for us? I don't know how, sort of, Apni status came out of it. How like a decent thing? Like there's both these other. Both these are done now. Okay, people talk, and both they don't uh, worry too much about it. There's a normal for everything, there's a really low level, there's a really high level, and there's a middle level, isn't there? Stick to that middle level. Have you ever listened to Zalima? Has to be two days latest after the nikah, yeah, or is it two days after the barat? Uh, the barat the after, after they start living together, the man and woman start living together. Maximum two. Some people get nikah, then they won't live together for about six months. So then they. I think then, you know, after six months, when they do move in together, yeah. then the first day after that night, yeah. uh, if not that day, then the next one, was will uh, Hazrat Aisha Ta'ala got married in the month of Shawwal, but her Rukhsati was two years later. Uh, so, Rukhsati baad me karna kisi for if there's some reason to do the Rukhsati later, there's nothing wrong with that. But Mother Hazrat Aisha, she was Nikah and then Rukhsati was two, I think it was two years later from what I can remember. And they were both in Shawwal. The Nikah was in Shaw, the month of Shawwal and the Rukhsati was in the month of Shawwal. So, I say that Aisha used to like uh, doing Rukhsati you know, in Shawwal. Uh, yeah, there's no month, there's no day in which it's not permissible. Yeah, it's permissible to get married in every month, every day. Okay. To everyone. So inshallah chapter 45 and 46 tomorrow and then 47 on Wednesday inshallah.